join us in a festival that promises to be extraordinary because Bali is extraordinary. Hi everyone and welcome to Ubud Writers and Readers Festival 2021. This year the festival returns with the theme Mulat Sarira, self-reflection, which is drawn from Balinese Hindu philosophy. From the 8th to the 17th of October we will be exploring the meaning of self-reflection, cultural introspection and human rights, examining who we are, what unites and divides us and what drives our actions. I'm Tim Hannigan, I am the moderator for this session, and our guest today is Wade Davis. Wade was born in British Columbia in Canada. He is a renowned cultural anthropologist, an ethnobotanist, and a widely published and acclaimed author of many books, more than 20, including One River and the Magisterial Into the Silence. He's also been involved in many documentary films. He's a photographer and an all round great traveler. He's Professor of Anthropology and the BC Leadership Chair in Cultures and Ecosystems at Risk at the University of British Columbia. He's a fellow of many august institutions and was Explorer in Residence at the National Geographic Society until 2013. And he's here today to talk to us about his latest book, Magdalena, River of Dreams. It's uh, another epic tranche of journey and geography, history and human encounter, and it's a return to a country that he has been closely engaged with for, well, for almost his entire life, Colombia. Wade, you're very welcome to Ubud in spirit, if not in person. Well, thank you, Tim. And uh, thanks so much for staying up so late uh, to host this, uh, this event uh, for everybody at the festival. I, I, I'm sorry we can't be meeting in the flesh, as they say, but uh, perhaps next year we'll be finally able to gather. That that would be wonderful, and I think we're I think we're all hoping for that. But it has been a spectacularly international festival this year, really spanning the globe uh, in in new ways. Um, so to to introduce the subject uh, of your book that we we're, we're here to talk about today, uh, I'd I'd like to sort of start by putting it in in context. One of the, the very many people that you meet in the book, and it's a book that just brims with people and voices, is the director of the Magdalena River Museum in Colombia. And he makes a comparison between the Magdalena and the Mississippi in that they're, they're both rivers that somehow encompass the experience of the nations through which they flow or, or possibly stand in a kind of cynic dope for the nation itself. But I think it's fair to say that unlike the Mississippi or the Amazon or, or maybe the Mekong, for most people in Indonesia, probably in Canada, certainly in, in Ireland and the rest of Europe, the Magdalena is not an immediately familiar name. It's not an immediately familiar river. So just to begin with, could you, could you give us the context? Could you set the geographical scene and explain something about the Magdalena and it? Sure. I mean, the thing is, Tim, every country, you know, a friend of mine once uh, wrote from India that on the, on the, on the Mother Ganga, you're never far from, uh, on the wild rivers, rather, she said, you're never far from the, um, the Ganga veins of the earth, right? In other words, every river has a, every country has a river that in a sense defines it. It's not necessarily the largest river. In, in Ireland, it might be the Shannon. Certainly in Britain, it would have to be the Thames. And in America, you know, in a way, the Hudson is almost as iconic as the Mississippi, although it's a mere filament in, in terms of size, scale, volume of water. But rivers aren't just corridors of commerce. They're also fountains of culture. And in the case of Magdalena, it's by no means the biggest river in Colombia. You know, it's dwarfed in scale by some of the great Amazonian affluents, the Cacata, the Valpez, the Putumayo. 
Um, but the thing is that the, the Magdalena has been the river that has defined the nation. Colombia as a country is a gift of the river, and the river is a story of Colombia. On one practical level, it's the home of 80% of the Colombian population of 50 million. It's a source of 80% of the economy. It powers the lights of all the great cities. But more than anything, it's been the the, 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 the way that an incredibly tortuous landscape, and if geography is destiny, never more so than the case of Colombia, it's both biologically the most diverse country on earth, but even more extraordinarily, it's the most ecologically and topographically diverse country on earth. There is no point in Colombia more than a day removed from every known ecological niche to, to be found on the planet. Um, the, 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 the nation um, is, is forged by the Andean Cordillera that kind of storms up from the south and it kind of hits the Colombian character and it kind of just stops like a great wall of stubbornness into this rugged knot of mountains called the Macizo Colombiano, out of which emerge the three great arms of the Andean Cordillera, the Oriental that forms the border with um, uh, eventually with Venezuela to the east and separates Andean Colombia from the limitless forests of the Amazon. Remember, the forests of the Amazon of Colombia alone are the size of France. North of that, the Great Plains, where you could hide Switzerland and the Swiss would never find it. And then the central Cordillera, which storms up the middle of the country until falling away into the limitless wetlands of the Caribbean coastal plain that just these vast cienegas that shine like mirrors to the heavens. And then, of course, the other Cordillera, the Cordillera Occidental, running up the uh, country to the west, separating Andean Colombia from the great Choco, the Pacific lowland forest, once a part of the Amazon until the Andes rose 40 million years ago. So inside this country, you have this extraordinary diversity. And out of that macizo come the rivers of Colombia, the Putumayo, the Caquetá, the Patia, and of course, the Mother Magdalena and its main affluence, the Cauca, right? And so, so th there's actually a point where you can cross, Tim, these ancient pre-Columbian Incaic roads of stones that in the rain fall away like mercury into the cloud forest. And there's a point where you can sit down where the river is born and reach out and touch with your right hand the birth of the Cordillera Oriental, this massive mountain range. And then with your left, you touch the birth of the Cordillera Central. You know, only in Colombia, think about it, can you walk ashore on a desert, uh, coastal desert in the Guajira, move your way through wetlands as wide as a sea, ascend through rich tropical forests to reach bucolic alpine valleys as, as sort of welcoming as anything to be found in the Scottish Highlands. So, you know, this is part of um, Colombia's sort of ongoing saga that, that Herman was talking about. And it's very interesting. You mentioned Herman Ferro, a great friend of mine, uh, who is the director of the One Museum in Colombia dedicated to the Magdalena River. And uh, he tells a wonderful story. Uh, you know, when his father was one of the engineers making the new city of Hirado, an important port at the confluence of the Rio Bogota and the Magdalena, when he was a kid, the family would talk about going to visit their dad on the weekends. Uh, you know, bajamos a, 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 a la tierra caliente. Let's go, to, let's go to hot country. No one ever told them they were going down to the river valley that had given birth to the nation. And it was only when he studied the cultures and anthropologists of the herreros, the muleteers. And the incredible thing about Colombia, it's incredible. At a time when Bogota was being called the Athens of South America, uh, every single thing in the capital, a place of great museums and institutions and universities and botanical gardens, not to mention incredible industrial infrastructure, everything ar arrived there on the back of a mule. There were no roads. There were no railroads. And in fact, in Medellin in, in 1910, Medellin exported 250,000 Panama hats all on the back of mules. And so these Caminos de Arriero, the, the, these trails of the Arrieros were like umbilical cords linking the, the urban centers of the hinterland with the great artery of life, the Magdalena. 
and together they became like threads in the in in the in the entire kind of tehillah in the weaving in the, in the cloth of the nation and and uh you know the topography was so challenging that as recently as 1950 you could ship a bushel of coffee from medellin to london for less money than shipping it across the country to bogota and here's another interesting thing because the river was the main corridor of commerce and the fountain of culture as i said at the same time, from the point of view of the metropolitan centers, Medellin, Bucaramanga, Bogota, um, yeah, Leso Cali and Neva, but you know, Manizales, Imperera, all these cities, from their point of view, the river was a frontier. And so these tiny little ports that arose on the banks of the river to service the metropolitan centers were from the point of view of those centers, the frontier. And yet the truth is they were heart of the country. And so you had this strange situation where like the Medio Magdalena, the middle part of the river, became this absolutely zone of the bandidos. It's no accident that Pablo Escobar put Hacienda Napoles there. It was a place of, 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 uh, of uh, outside of the, uh, of the norms of the state in a way. And just back, you mentioned again, just to finish up in a way with this, with Herman, because... You know, one of the themes that I, uh, over the five years that I researched and wrote this book, it was kind of like sociology of serendipity. I would turn up in the Cuenca uh, and wait around until I found someone who had something to say that the world needed to hear, which is what Hemingway said was the essence of good storytelling. And the Spanish subtitle of the book, Historias de Colombia, is much kind of more accurate because the book is really almost stenography of these incredible Colombians who have endured so much, and all of them equate the river to their destiny. They all say, if we want to clean up the national soul, we must clean up the river. If we clean up the river, it will be to clean up the national soul. And to understand what that means, let me just read this little short passage directly from the mouth of Herman when I interviewed him in the old colonial town of Onda. And he said, I'll, <clears throat> I'll never forget the moment when I first heard that the peace agreement had been signed in Havana. By chance, I was at the very confluence of the Rio Cauca and the Rio Magdalena. These are the two great rivers that come out to join each other below the, um, the nose of the Corriere Central. I was at the confluence of the Rio Cauca and the Rio Magdalena. I was completely overwhelmed by what I can only call geographical emotion, a sense of space as if the spirits were emerging from the earth. I stripped off my clothes and placed my head in the river. As I stood in the sun, the water dripping down my naked body, I began to weep. Rivers of tears flowed as I realized that my son could grow up in a country at peace. A river that has known every tragedy, that has carried the dead and all the misery of the nation, that has suffered along with all Colombians, a river that I love so much. And there we were by its waters as peace came over the land. And, and so you, with the Magdalena, you have to understand that it was the open graveyard of the nation. The iconic image that goes right back to, uh, to Gabo, to Garcia Marquez. Um, you know, of, of uh, you know, uh, bodies floating down the river, con gardinazos encima, you know, it's like with, with vultures on top, you know, um, the river did become the cemetery of the nation. I mean, one of the things that, uh, and one of the motivations I had in this, in this writing, this book, is to, in a sense, tell a certain truth about Colombia. You know, the, the, no country has been more grotesquely reduced to caricatures. And, and uh, yes, cocaine has colored the recent history of Colombia, but those responsible for the blood of 260,000 innocent dead, 100,000 missing, 7 million internally displaced, 5 million forced to flee their country. Think for a minute, Tim, if Canada had patterns of drug consumption in bars and boardrooms across our country, Laws that facilitated the creation of a black market trade, but sanctions did, did nothing to curb that trade whatsoever, such that 85 million Americans were forced to flee their homes. Well, that's what happened to Colombia.
And despite that, in a war that lasted 50 years, a war that not, would not have lasted a day without the illicit pro profits, the sordid profits of prohibition, in all of that time, there were never more than 200, 300,000 combatants on all three sides of the conflict in a country of 50 million people. The vast majority of Colombians were innocent victims of a war of cocaine. In the last year of peace, before President Santos worked out the deal with the FARC in Havana that was signed in Cartagena, the FARC were down to maybe 6,000 6, cadres, mostly teenagers in search of three meals a day. Yet they nevertheless made $600 million in extortion and kidnapping and drug trafficking in that last year. And if you give me the Boy Scouts of Dublin or you give me the Boy Scouts of Beverly Hills and $600 million, you know what kind of havoc. In fact, I don't frankly have to tell an Irishman. And I honestly, him, I don't know if you know this, but I've got an Irish passport as well. I'm Irish 100%. Uh, Colombian, 110%. Canadian, <laughs> more or less, 90%. But there you go. But you know, I don't have to tell an Irishman what it means for that blood money to come into to as fuel in a conflict, mm -hmm. uh, a conflict that most citizens simply want to go away. And again, you know, the, the scale of the cocaine thing is hard to imagine. At the height of the Medellin cartel, the Escobar and the Ochoa brothers and their cadre or their cohorts we're putting 80 tons of cocaine into America every month, generating $70 million a day in profits. Um, in order to measure the wealth coming back into Columbia, they bailed $100 bills in hay bales and approximated the, the value. The accountants in Medellin would budget a thousand US dollars a week just to buy elastic bands. <laughs> Most Colombians have never seen, let alone use cocaine. And yet the incredible thing about the country is despite this war that in good measure was imposed upon it by everybody you've ever met who's ever used or peddled illicit cocaine, the country nevertheless maintained its civil society and democracy, mm -hmm. greened its cities, created millions of acres of national parks, sought restitution with indigenous people in a way that no nation state can match, welcomed most, most recently 2 million refugees from Venezuela, not, not turning them away at the border as America has a propensity to do. These were families of children and grandparents who were welcomed, housed, fed, given medical attention. Their kids were sent to school. The Colombian government in its greatest moment of need, desperately in need of every peso that it had to fund a peace process, nevertheless welcomed the, the Venezuelans, and and I might add, gave them permits to work. No nation state in the history of the world has been that generous to a neighbor in need. And that speaks to something about the Colombian character. You know, this idea that, you know, Colombia is a place of, of, of drugs and violence. I mean, it's been, it's been stained by drugs and violence for the reasons I've alluded to. But I would argue that only a people as rich in character, as, as, as infused with what I call colores y cariño, colors and love, only such a people with such a sense of humor, such an enduring spirit, such a love of nations, such a love of each other, such a strength of character infused and formed by that landscape. Don't forget, in literature, when we talk about Gabo, you know, Garcia Marquez, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and magical realism, you know, we, 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 th Think of that as his great gift, maybe Columbia's great gift to Latin American literature in the world. But remember, Gabo was a journalist. He was a practicing newspaper man all of his life. He just wrote about what he saw. He just happened to live in a land where heaven and earth, much like in Ireland, come together on a regular basis to reveal glimpses of the divine. Magic becomes an antidote to fear. The reality comes into focus through the reassuring lens of the phantasmagoric, a God that has given so much to a people as the Colombians never cease to acknowledge, always gets his back, his piece on the back end. I, I was going to ask you next what it was about Colombia that had driven this, this lifelong relationship. I think, I think many of us who, who come from countries that uh, give us a powerful passport if we're lucky enough to have a powerful passport we have an early encounter 
with, yeah, with yeah, I uh, think an exotic yeah. land that, that forms a romance yeah, and, I, I think, Jim, and an obsession. Awesome. But, but, but to, to maintain it uh, at the level that you've maintained across life yeah. does suggest that there's something about Colombia that's out of the ordinary, given how many other places you've yeah, been. Yeah, life no, I, 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 you know, I think... Um, I think Tim, you probably feel the same. I think most travelers do that. There, there, you, you kind of create this affection for the First Nation that, as you know, gives you license to be free. I mean, I remember, you know, speaking to sort of friends of mine, you know, and I said, "Well, what's your favorite place in the world?" And someone would say, "Cameroon." I said, "Jesus, I've been there. How the hell, you know, why that? You know, well, because of some." you know, fundamental experience in the Peace Corps or whatever. And I was very fortunate that I came from a very modest um, Canadian family. But I, my mother was um, a humble woman, but determined. And in a way that I can hardly imagine, in 1967, she decided that Spanish was a language of the future. And she worked all year as a secretary in a public elementary school to raise enough money to allow me to join a group of schoolboys at a Canadian a uh, language teacher was taken to Cali in the summer of 1968. Now, let's remember that in 1968, most Canadians had never been in an airplane. And if they went anywhere, they went to Paris or London. Columbia was a lot further away. And uh, so I was sent down, and I was very fortunate because I was at 14, by far the youngest of the group. And whereas the other lads were billeted with wealthy families and spent, for the most part, a kind of sweltering summer in the streets of Cali, hanging out at the country club in good measure. I was with a much more modest family, high up in the mountains, away from the city, at the edge of trails that reached west to the Pacific. And for the 12 weeks, I never saw another Canadian. And it was a kind of a classic Colombian scene, an indulgent father, a, a grandmother who muttered to herself on a porch overlooking Fruit, fruit trees and flower beds, uh, an angelic sister who more than once carried me and her brother home half drunk to a mother kind beyond words who stood by the garden steps, you know, hands on hips, feigning anger as she tapped her toes on the stone steps. For like 12 weeks, I encountered the kind of the, the decency and warmth of people who had some kind of understanding of the frailty of the human spirit, this deep compassion for what it meant to be alive. And that's just a I suppose, a kind of a nice way of saying that you could dance with your girlfriend in a moment and dance with your mother in the next and then go drinking with the boys. Now, I, at 14, I didn't really know a better formula for life. And I don't know how, what happens in Ireland, really, Tim. But I'll tell you, in Canada, you don't dance with your girlfriend's mother at the age of 14. But in Columbia, you do. And then, you know, something... And the other funny thing about the story is I later found out that uh, all the mothers were on the phones with the other mothers and because all these other Canadian boys were succumbing to what the Colombians call mamitis or homesickness. And of course, not only was I not homesick, I felt like I'd finally found home. And, um, you know, years later, uh, I fell into the orbit of Richard Evans Schultes, a great Colombian botanical explorer, um, my professor at Harvard. And I, I literally was in a cafe in Harvard Square with a roommate, and there was a National Geographic map of the world in front of us. And David, my roommate, looked at the map, and he looked at me, and he pointed to the high Arctic. Well, I, I was 19 years old. I had to go somewhere, and I watched my arm lift, and it landed in the northwest Amazon of Colombia. Had it landed in Italy, I might have become a Renaissance <laughs> scholar. But having decided to go to the Amazon, there was only one man to see, this kindly professor who shot blowguns in class and kept outside his door a bucket of peyote buttons available to the students as an optional laboratory experiment. And I knocked on his door, and I, he was such an Anglophile that one of his colleagues said the only way for Schultes to go native would be to go to London. And so I got as far as saying, sir, I'm from British Columbia. Well, he heard that adjective, and then he heard Columbia, which he thought he meant his beloved Columbia, where he had spent 12 uninterrupted years exploring the Northwest Amazon. And I said, I've saved up money in a logging camp. I want to go to the Amazon as you did and collect plants. And the man for whom mountains had been named in South America just peered across a mound of specimens through his antiquated bifocals and said, well, son, when do you want to go? And two weeks later, I, I got off the plane in Bogota. And, you know, at the time, I believed that bliss was an objective state that you could experience. I, if you just open yourself to the world, I had a small backpack of clothes 
uh, two books, Lawrence's Taxonomy of Vascular Plants and Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. And I literally, both metaphorically uh, and literally, drank from every stream, including tire tracks in the road. And of course, I was constantly sick. But that was even part of the experience, sort of malarial fevers that rose and through the night and broke with the dawn. Once on a, a day's notice, I accepted a commission to guide an eccentric British journalist who had walked from Tierra del Fuego. He was walking to Alaska. He needed someone to guide him across the notorious Darien Gap, which given his route for us was about 200 miles of swamp and rainforest. And we got lost at one point for a fortnight <clears throat> with three indigenous, in, in some native people. It was a complete, complete disaster. But when I finally found my way to safety and stumbled off a small plane in Panama City, uh, I had only the ragged clothes on my back, um, three dollars to my name. My clothes were drenched in vomit from the uh, fellow passengers from the small flight. I had no one to talk to, nowhere to go, no place to be. But I had never felt more alive in my life. And so I think Columbia, you know, sort of. Um, you know, I owe so much to Columbia because Columbia made my life possible. You know, it's it, it wasn't just a matter of a country where you you find yourself. It, it was a country that um, you know it, it, my destiny was was made was, was there. You know, and uh, it's funny even today. Like when I when I when I speak publicly in Spanish in lectures or in interviews. Like even my accent is the accent of the street, man, because I mean, <laughs> I, I grew up speaking with the Campesinos. I, I had no money. I lived in the huts with the indigenous people. I, I just so I could I kind of in a way, you know, I think part of the, the thing is that obviously we know that Colombia is a very hierarchical class based society in terms of all, both social values, education and, of course, economic well-being. And um, it, it, in such a place, it can be quite difficult for scions of the elite to actually kind of you know relate to the characters in the street just like in dublin you know someone some toff from trinity might have trouble with the dock workers down you know but if you grew up with the dock workers you just can get hang you know and and that, that that's I, I, in a weird way i'm more comfortable in the streets of columbia than anywhere else in the world that that's i, I mean that, that's a fascinating sort of uh, point and i think it's something to do with with having that insider outsider access that you have if you're not from a place but you have that long involvement uh, my my own early travels in indonesia pale pale alongside all of what you've just told us but I do have a kind of rough East Java accent when I speak Indonesia. Oh, so, okay. yeah, there you <laughs> go. That's like for, for, for similar reasons, kind of living, living in, um, yeah, living amongst people who are not. You know, not I, think, I think one thing, the other thing, you know, that's sort of a nice theme for, for, for the a writer's festival is to, it, it, it's sort of the power of books, you know, I mean, all of this came about quite um, accidentally, you know, I decided I wanted to tell, um, really out of out of loyalty to my professor who was instrumental in my professional life i wanted i wanted to put him i wanted to elevate him to where i thought he deserved to be and i wrote a book which was essentially his biography called one river and the fascinating thing is when it came out in spanish in 2002 in this incredibly limited edition in bogota it was at a time when um colombia's very future was being called into question as a nation state uh, and you wouldn't think that a book on botany and botanical exploration and ethno excuse me ethnography would have really kind of you know caught the attention of a, a nation in crisis but it did in part because of the beauty of the translation by the late Nicolas Sesquan this great poet who in many ways it's his book but but more importantly at a time when Columbia was an absolute pariah reduced to caricature let me just tell you a story the former uh, ambassador uh, Carolina Barco, a good friend of mine, the ambassador of the United States, former head of external affairs, um, daughter of a revered Colombian president, was famously strip searched at Washington Dulles Airport strictly because she had a Colombian passport. And when she presented her diplomatic credentials and objected to such foul treatment, the agent simply barked an obscenity at her as if barked from the mouth of a dog. Well, if that's how the highest representative of the government is treated, imagine what happens when a young Colombian kid crosses the border, uh, uh, how he's treated. So there's this 
huge psychological impact of, of, of being raised in a prior nation, if you will. And when one river came out as El Rio in Spanish, here was suddenly almost 700 pages about the essence of a country that was in complete defiance of the dark cliches. And for young people by that point, incapable of traveling within their own nation because of fear of the violence or fear of kidnapping, the book became kind of a map of dreams of places they might travel because a big part of the book was an account not just of my professor's travels in the 1940s and 50s, but also of the travels that I did with his protege, Tim Plowman, in the 1970s when we studied the sacred leaf, the plant known to the Inca as a divine leaf of immortality, of course, coca, the notorious source of cocaine. And so I think the book became very important for two generations of young Colombians only because it it said it said what was true about the country you know it it said the glory of the country you know that only such a people could have survived and and then when magdalena came out if, if el rio was like a map of dreams hector abad who who is one of colombia's great writers and he wrote an incredible memoir called in english oblivion about the murder of his father and in all of the rivers of blood because of the cocaine trade in Colombia. Uh, there have been there were about five deaths, including the presidential candidate Galan and a handful of others that really shook the nation, shook it to its core. And the death of Hector's father was one of them. He was a physician, he was apolitical, he was a social reformer, he was all that was great in a human being, and he was murdered. And uh, millions of people came out in the streets of Medellin, but it naturally forced Heck, my friend Hector, into exile in Italy. And naturally, he grew up embittered by what had happened to his father. And he became a great public intellectual in Colombia, a, a, a revered author. But everybody knew that he had this kind of, this kind of, this kind of uh, vein of bitterness. And so when he writes of Magdalena, as he did, um, only Wade uh, could make me love my country again. I mean, that's just a beautiful endorsement of the book. And um, and Hector and I, you know, met in Italy at a writers' festival, a writers' retreat, and we'd write furiously all morning long, and then in the afternoon we'd go on these fantastic walks together. And in a way, in a weird way, I I could introduce him to a part of his country he had never been able to see. I mean, we were mambiando, pichando coca todo el tiempo, you know, and he had never really chewed coca, which is hard to imagine, you know. But we we just had a lot of fun, and we're like brothers today but i but that i think i think it's it's something that you know um maybe could could encourage other writers to realize that mm -hmm. even in this era of the internet and uh, uh, poor attention spans and, and and the end of private bookstores whatever we lament books can come out of nowhere and have a a very powerful influence on uh, on history, they really can move the dial in in, in, in a certain way. I think it's also a, a great um, a great testament to to the, the the value of the 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 traveling writer, if you like. I think travel writing or the the process of somebody from typically from a, a wealthy Western country going to a less a less wealthy um, developing or post-colonial country is a, is a dynamic that we sometimes find a little bit problematic. Sometimes uh, people are uncomfortable with, there's been a lot of critical discourse around it. But I think what comes out of the story of, of your writing about Colombia is, is the thing that gets overlooked that those books can be read in the place that's being written about has happened with oh, absolutely. but I, I wondered wade i wondered wade how that that awareness obviously writing one river you weren't necessarily thinking that this was going to be a hit in colombia this was a book for a non-colombian audience written in english but then writing the new one writing magdalena you knew that this was oh, that's a very good point. In, in I mean, so, so how yeah. did that? How did that impact on? Well, the, you know, the it, it, again, you know, it's, things tend to be kind of um, serendipitous. In the case, you're absolutely in, in one river was written absolutely with the English audience in mind. I didn't even really think of you know by that point, you know, in the '90s, I hadn't really been living in Colombia. You know, my life had taken me elsewhere in in the, um particularly my decade or more at the national geographic and uh um 
and and you know but in in i quite unexpectedly el, el rio became this massive best selling cult book in fact it the, the national library of colombia in anticipation of the 200th anniversary of colombian independence which is this year uh, selected the top 200 books in the nation's history. And of the first 25 selected, um, One River was one of them. And so it's recognized in Columbia as not just being a travel account, but of a book that came out at a certain moment in time um, that, that, that said something important to, to the Colombian people. And that's something I'm enormously... Uh, proud of. Magdalena was very different. I mean, Magdalena actually came out of the success of El Rio, and one of the people who had read um, El Rio was a wonderful man um, who was the head of Grupo Argos, which is one of Colombia's great corporate citizens. And the company wanted to do something for the Colombian people with the, with the peace agreement on the horizon. And so they funded um, a team led by two um, acclaimed journalists from Medellin, Hector Rincon and Ana Cano, to create a series of books called Savia Botanica, which brought together journalists, photographers, and botanists to write a beautiful illustrated book on each of the five major um, regions of Colombia, the Caribbean coastal plain, the Pacific forest of the Choco, the Amazonian forest of, of um, the Valpes and beyond, the Amazonas, and of course the great eastern, northeastern plains, and then the Andean heart of the country. And these books weren't to be sold, but gifted to every library in the country to send a message to a new generation of kids that their country wasn't a place of war and violence, and bloodshed, but a place of biodiversity with more species of birds than any other, you know. I mean, and, th and this, I, by the way, this idea of natural history, but let me just diverge here. Colombia is also the only country on earth forged with an idea of nature. Don't forget, the mentor of Simon Bolivar was Alexander von Humboldt. You know, the 75,000 miles that the liberator rode as he freed not just a sliver of land, as George Washington did, but an entire continent. And as he rode, his saddlebags had the maps of Humboldt. That's how he got around. And when Humboldt spoke of a great universe of nature, he was speaking in metaphor to some extent. Simon took it literally. And the thing is, Simon hated the Spaniards because the Spaniards had a purely extractive model. Nobody born in the Americas could possibly succeed. You couldn't have a printing press. You couldn't grow certain kinds of food. It was completely exploitation. And so for Simon, he saw the treatment of landscape the extraction of resources, the falling of forests as part and parcel with the way that the Spaniards had treated him and his family, right? And so by contrast, he saw the celebration of the natural world as being the pure essence of patriotism. And that's what we've been saying all the time about the Rio Magdalena. Don't make the cleanup of the Magdalena um, an issue of regulations or a environmental cause, make it a statement of patrimony, of, 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 of patriotism. And so that's... That, a, that's yeah, that's, that, that was one of the, one of the, 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 the key take-homes. I mean, it's, it's the point that appears at the very, very end of the book, again, yeah. from one of the, the many people that... Well, that you know, this all, came, this, of, this all came about, if I could say, you, yeah. know, you know, I didn't go into this project with any plans on writing a book or let alone how the book would be written. In fact, the original assignment is that when we finished doing the five books on botany, uh, we were having lunch uh, and I said, well, we've done the land. Let's do the rivers. It was a flippant comment. And being Colombian, they said, great, let's do it. And so I said, well, let's start with the Magdalena because the Magdalena is the river that everybody's turned their backs on. I mean, the Magdalena, one river, that book of mine, is almost 700 pages in Spanish. The word Magdalena appears five times. Everybody in Colombia has a kind of collective amnesia about the importance of this river. So I was originally just going to be doing a 7,000 word essay for an illustrated book. But what happened is by the time I wasn't even out of the Macizo Colombiano and I had written 40,000 words. So the whole thing kind of took. And then I just, in this magical way, um, my friends in Colombia, new friends and old, just kind of carried me down the river 
always someone interesting to meet, always a new voice, you know? I mean, and and again, back to this thing of natural history, like there was a guy I met, I love, called Morita de los Manatees, Morita the Manatees, right? And he had a kind of, he was like an avatar of these remarkable creatures, and he they were the source of his power, what allowed him to face down the paracos, the paramilitary militias of the death squads, and also the 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 the, the guerrero, guerrero of, of the left, the FARC and the ELN and so on. And uh, one time I uh, I was just with him around a little wetland, and uh, and he told me that working with the kids from the local school, they had identified seventy five species of butterflies just around that little bit of water. And I said, "Carajo, hombre, es increíble, porque in Canada we maybe have 200 in this amazing country, huge country. And then he said to me something so Colombia, he said, ah, sí, hermano, pero la cosa es eso, es que tiene que entender que en Colombia una mariposa es solamente un flor que puede volar, es por eso tenemos tanto. And he was saying, brother, you have to understand. Look, in, the thing is that in Colombia, a butterfly is just a flower that knows how to fly. That's why we have so many. Well, that that is so much what. And, and another incident I, I recount in the in the book is um, I was uh, I was uh, I heard that the mamos, the sun priests of the Arawakos, descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization, who to this day, um, in a bloodstained continent, never fully conquered by the West, and they remain ruled by a ritual priesthood. And one of the most erudite uh, and and respected of all the mamos of the um, of the Arawakos is um, Mamo Camillo, an old friend of mine. I you know I first lived with him in 1974. I've known individual people there since they were babies and so on. And um, and and I learned that the mamos from time to time made ritual payments at the mouth of the Magdalena. Um, be, beyond the black line, which is their traditional um, uh, boundary uh, around the base of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, and so I said, "Why don't we go over and like do a do a ritual payment?" And and uh, he's cool, and so we got together in this bus, twenty six men, women, and children. We roared over to the River Delta. At the mouth itself, this rocky spit goes out into the Caribbean. It's home to these modest fishermen who live in huts of shacks and gray and decorate their shacks in defiance of poverty with poetry and they fish at night only with a north wind using uh, kites put together from refuse and plastic and garbage to carry their hooks out into the into the sea you know so we did this and en route to make the ritual payment and of course the mamas always say that the water that goes down a river is no different than the blood in the veins of a human which in terms of the hydrological cycle is quite correct. And they also told me that originally they would make pilgrimages to the very source of the river, 1,500 kilometers, and en route they would stop in every settlement and ascertain the level of consciousness with which a people viewed that river. That was a measure of the depth of humanity to them. And en route, uh, Mamo Camilo told me that President Santos was planning to visit their home ter- their home community of Namasimake in four days. Could I be there with them to uh, help welcome the president? And I said I'd try, knowing full well the only way I could get there would be by hitching a ride on the presidential plane. So I made some phone calls, and, and a couple of days later, I got a call back from Palacio Nariño saying President Santos would be delighted to have Profi Davis come along. So I flew from Barranquilla to Bogota, where a soldier met me and took me over to the presidential plane. And then with the ministers and the president, we flew back up to the coast of Ayurupar to get the helicopters. And en route, all of his aides were peppering him with statistics as to what he should say in the speech that was going to go out to the nation and the world. And I sheepishly put up my my hand and said to the president in Spanish, you know, something Mamo Camilo had told me. I said, you know, he had said, you know, Peace won't matter if it's just an excuse for the three sides, military, right-wing militias, left-wing guerrillas, to come together to maintain a war against nature. We have to make peace with the entire natural world. And President Santos made that his the theme of his speech when we got to Namasimake. And then we were in the men's sacred temple, and the president was introducing his 
um, his um, um, his associates, you know, the ministers, and and he got around to me, and he couldn't have been more generous with with uh, his, his uh, description of me. But he was interrupted by one of the mamo said, "No, no, no, presidente, you don't have to tell us about that guy. He's our ambassador in Washington D.C." Which I was kind of, you know. <laughs> and so then, and then, so then I. I, I flew back with the president to Bogota, and I was just in time to jump on a plane back to Barranquilla, where that night my daughter, with her Colombian cumbia band, she was the only gringa in the in the band, had been invited to play with Carlos Vivas on stage in front of 10,000 people. Now, Carlos Vivas is both an incredible ethnomusicologist, but he's also the greatest probably star in Latin America, but part of the wonder of Carlos is he always invites these acts into his limelight. He, he's that generous, right? And, um, and then I flew back from, from, uh, from that concert, and I got word in Medellin the next day that President Uribe would like to see me. So wait, I'm, wait, wait. I'm a very sorry, but we are, we are more or less out of time. Ah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm receiving, receiving warnings here to, oh, well, yeah. to I end. finish that story. I, I went up, I, 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 on the way up, they told me, look, President Uribe is going to have a bunch of people at this fiesta. Try to get a word in edgewise about our dream of cleaning up the river. Well, I got to his hacienda got through security and I rolled down and there was just one lovely lady at the front door. It was much admired wife of President Uribe, Alina um, uh, uh, Moreno. And and uh, she welcomes me to the house and says, you know, Prof, have you had lunch yet? And I, I know I didn't. I ended up having lunch with President Uribe. And then we had a two hour kind of mind meld about how we could actually clean up the river. And then as as I left, I was able, he thanked me for helping Colombia, but I thanked him because I said, even though you and President Santos may not get along, history will record that it took the two of you to make possible the conditions of peace in Colombia. And to be able to do that all in five days um, is, is part of the magic of what happens to one. I'll tell you one last thing, Tim. You know, I, I want to stress to people how dangerous Colombia is as a nation. And the biggest danger in Colombia is that you're going to go down there and you're going to discover that you have no interest whatsoever in ever leaving. That's the main danger of traveling and being with the Colombian people. Well, that that's a very fine, uh, fine message to finish on, although I would say hopefully next year we might get you to Ubud in person and you might find that Indonesia has a similar a similar capacity we'll 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 have to test it out wait wait we could we could listen listen to you talking about uh colombia all night all day um a phrase that came up there uh, from from one of your one of the people you you met was that idea of geographical emotion but i think there's something else going on here which is a kind of geographical passion and i think mm. you very clearly very clearly have that for this place the book magdalena river of dreams is a, is a fantastic manifestation of that uh, the stories that wade has shared with us here today are, are just a just a small part of what goes into that book so I, I would i would highly recommend it um wade thank you very very much for um for being here with us at ubud and thank you to everyone else all the audience here for supporting Yais and Mudraswari Saraswati patrons program and to the festival's partners who made the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival possible. Uh, you can follow Ubud Writers Festival on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at Ubud Writers Festival or visit ubudwritersfestival.com for more information about the program. And we'll see you next time in the next event. Thank you.